anterior, II. The two are linked by the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Let's have a look at the anatomy, the neuroanatomy. The brainstem reflex is involved in coordinating the detections of movements of the head with the movements of the eyes so that we can keep looking at something as our head moves. The vestibular ocular reflex is a fascinating uh, set of neural circuitry. It must be quite short and it must be quite simple because it has to be really, really fast. The retina, of course, has a central area, uh, the fovea, the macula, that you are, it's got your high, highest density of um, retinal neurons in there, it's your highest density vision. So you're trying to focus that bit, you're trying to point that bit at the bit of the world that you're trying to look at. Um, so either as you're moving your head, you're able to very easily keep your eyes looking at the thing you're looking at, or while you're moving along and your head is moving, your eyes are kept pointed at the thing that you want to look at. Um, it has to be a fast reflex, otherwise if it was a little bit slowed your vision would be a little bit blurred because it would be a little bit out of sync with the movements of your head. Um, so it probably doesn't use any visual processing circuits that might be a bit slower. We're talking difference of, differences of milliseconds here. So let's have a look at the sensory part in the ears, how that gets to the brainstem, the parts of the brainstem involved in the reflexes and then the motor outputs, so the brainstem nuclei, the it's going to be the ocular motor nerves, isn't it? Because the muscles of the eye, the extraocular muscles of the eye are the ones that are moving the eye. Let's pull all that together. I am struggling a little bit with the level of detail to pitch this at, but let's try this. Here's the ear. It's an enlarged ear. Um, here is the, the inner ear inside the petrous part of the uh, temporal bone. There's the external auditory meatus, there's the tympanic membrane, the eustachian tube and whatnot. So if I dissect away the bone here, we can see the inner ear apparatus. And if I pop that out, we can see the three semicircular canals and the two otolith organs, the utricle and the saccule, alongside the cochlea. So the cochlea is for hearing. Um, the structures inside here are very similar. There are hair cells that deflect, that get, get bent, and then that triggers the production of action potentials being sent along neurons back to the brain, uh, both in terms of hearing and um, the vestibular system, because these bits are the vestibular system. In the semicircular canals and the otolith organs, we find endolymph, the, the fluid inside. Um, and the hair cells, which are modified neurons, the hairs are embedded into a calcium carbonate and gel matrix, giving them a little bit of mass. Um, when you move, so the otolith organs detect a linear acceleration, up and down, backwards and forwards, whereas the three semicircular canals are arranged in such a way so as to detect rotation of the head in the three axes, right? Um, so as you rotate your head, the, um, <laughs> well, let's say, as you rotate your head, the endolymph flows around the semicircular canal, deflects the hair cells, and that triggers uh, the production of an increased rate of action potentials. You might also think of it as the endolymph um, stays where it is, and the semicircular canal rotates around it. An example here is if you've got a cup of tea and you spin the mug, the tea stays where it is and the mug moves around it, right? Semicircular canals. But the principle is the same. As you rotate your head, um, the endolymph moves relative to the hair cells, the hair cells get deflected and that triggers the neurons. At rest, there is a low rate of action potential firing. When you move in that plane of rotation or the linear bits as well, the rate of action potential production in that neuron increases. We have this apparatus in the left sides and the right sides, and they are mirror images of one another. So if you rotate your head in one direction, the endolymph is gonna flow one way 
on one side and the opposite way on the other side, which means the hair cells will get deflected one way on one side and the opposite way on the other side, which means that when you rotate your head in one direction, one semicircular canal on one side will increase the rate of action potential uh, generation and the semicircular canal hair cells on the opposite side will do the opposite and decrease the rate of action potential generation. All of this information goes back to the brainstem. If I put this apparatus back into the model, um, so the rate of action potential generation is proportional to the rate of acceleration. And the vestibular part of the vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight, runs from this apparatus through the internal acoustic meatus, a canal in the bone here in the petrous part of the temporal bone, back to the brainstem and it enters the brainstem at the medulla. Ooh, you can see the vestibular ganglion here. So this being a, um, these being sensory neurons, there needs to be a ganglion. The, the collection of nerve cell bodies will be um, outside the central nervous system. So there's the vestibular ganglion for this stuff. Anywho, medulla, the brain, the brainstem, uh, medulla oblongata, pons and midbrain, and the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight, so we number these sequentially as we descend. We're quite a, quite a way down here, a little bit more than halfway. The vestibulocochlear nerve enters the medulla oblongata and we find a number of vestibular nuclei on either side. There is a medial vestibular nucleus, a lateral vestibular nucleus, a superior vestibular nucleus and an inferior vestibular nucleus. Suggests there are some important things going on here. So there are medial, lateral, superior and inferior vestibular nuclei in the medulla. So that's the sensory input. Now, depending upon what sensory input comes in and what needs to happen, those nuclei relay information to the ocular motor nuclei. So by ocular motor nuclei, I mean we have the abducens nucleus in the pons which is the collection of nerve cell bodies for the somatic motor neurons of the abducens nerve, which will innervate the lateral rectus muscle and abduct the pupil. And then in the midbrain, a little bit further up, where we find much of the eye stuff, in the midbrain we have the trochlear nucleus and the ocular motor nucleus. The trochlear nucleus is where we have the neuron cell bodies for the somatic motor neurons of the trochlear nerve, which is going to innervate the superior oblique muscle, um, and the ocular motor nerve, so the ocular motor nucleus is going to provide the somatic motor neurons for the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve three, which is going to innervate all of the other extra ocular muscles, so the superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus. We'll look at those in a moment. The links between those vestibular nuclei and the various ocular motor nuclei, trochlear, ocular motor abducens, occurs in the medial longitudinal fasciculus. So there's a, there's a tract in here linking those things. The reason I say it varies is, well, it, 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 the reflex varies depending upon your, whether you're rotating your head like this, or like this, or like this, or moving like that, right? Different inputs to different vestibular nuclei will link to different ocular motor nuclei and cause different movements of the eye. But the principle is the same, and that's what we're going to anchor on here. So here's the eye. We're in the orbit. The cranial cavity is just here. So the brainstem, the midbrain, is, is right here. So the trochlear nerve, the abducens nerve, and the ocular motor nerve don't have far to travel. They travel through the superior orbital fissure, and they get into the orbit and innervate their respective muscles. So here is lateral rectus, which is going to be innervated by the abducens nerve. Um, up here we have superior rectus. Down there we have inferior rectus. If I take that off, we can see the superior oblique muscle and the medial rectus and the inferior oblique muscle here. If you want to know what these muscles do, I've done a whole load of eye videos. Go and have a look at those and you'll see those in more detail. But these are the extraocular muscles of the eye. They move the eye. They change the direction of gaze, the direction of your, your pupil, okay? 
Right, now here's the real challenge. Let's see if we can join that all up with an example. We've got, this, we've got the sensory bit, we've got the reflex, we've got the motor bit. So let's just take the single example of rotating the head in this plane. So we're using the lateral semicircular canals, right? Um, the hair cells are in the ampulla, the, the widened bit of the semicircular canal. And when the endolymph flows towards the ampulla and the hair cells deflect, that increases the rate of action potential production. So if we turn, <laughs> if we turn the head to the left, to the, to the left, then the flow of end endolymph is towards the ampulla on the left side. Um, so as you turn your head to the left, the lateral semicircular canal hair cells increase the rate of action potential production and the, the lateral semicircular canals hair cells reduce their rate of action potential production on the right side. So you have those two inputs passing in the vestibular cochlear nerve to the medulla, to those vestibular nuclei. Now, the output we want is that I keep my eyes on you as I turn my head to the left. So that means that input, the vestibular nuclei, then passes to uh, the abducens nucleus and the ocular motor nucleus. Because what's going to happen is we have to have different outputs to different sides. So. Um, the abducens nucleus on the left side is going to relax and allow that muscle to lengthen. But the abducens muscle on the right side is going to contract and pull my gaze. It's going to abduct my pupil, abduct my gaze, so I keep my eye on you. And then the oculomotor nucleus, uh, the one on the left, is going to uh, tell the medial rectus muscle on the left to contract which has pulled my pupil medially, so I'm keeping my eye on you. Whereas the ocular motor nucleus on the right is sending out impulses to tell the medial rectus muscle on the right to relax and lengthen. <laughs> the, uh, the reason I struggle with the level of detail here is because there are other neural integrators. So I said that the otolith organs and the semicircular canals are sending information based on the rate of acceleration, right? But when you've finished moving your head, you're not accelerating anymore. When you finish the movement, you don't want your eyes to snap back to the middle. You want to keep them on what you were looking at. So there are other um, nuclei in the brainstem, other neural integrators that keep your eye where you want it to be once you've finished the movement, when you finish moving your head. Also, there are links with the cerebellum. Um, the cerebellum is important in managing the fine control. Also, of course, in other rotational movements, other muscles being activated and deactivated, but the principle is the same. Um, more complicated, possibly, is that there are links with the cerebrum, because I said that this is a... This is a a fairly simple and short circuit, and it needs to be because it needs to be super quick for it to work. But there are links with the cerebrum because this is a reflex that can adapt and can kind of be learned and unlearned. And the best example is when you put glasses on, you've changed your magnification. So the, 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 the amount and the rate at which the eye moves as you move your head changes, but you, you learn this when you wear a new pair of glasses for a week or two. But there are other examples as well. On top of that, there are vestibulospinal and vestibulocolic reflexes. Colic with a double L referring to the neck. So there are other reflexes that move skeletal muscles in the neck for the same purpose, right? But those will be for another, another day. Uh, what about the clinical bits and bobs here? Well, um, I guess one of the key I, I, there are, there are textbooks written on this sort of thing. But one of the key ideas is that the vestibular apparatus, there's one on either side, they're a mirror image of each other, they're matched, they're both sending information to the brain, and the brain uses both sets of information to work out what to do with your eyes. Which means that if there's a mismatch in information, 
if there is something wrong with one side but the other side is sending the right information, that reflex gets confused and still causes the eyes to move. And this is one of the reasons the room spins. This is nystagmus with the eyes flicking um, in, a, in a predictable pattern um, from side to side. Nystagmus. This is what we mean by, by vertigo. Um, so an infection or um, I said that the hair cells are embedded in a, a gelatinous carbon, uh, calcium carbonate. If you get crystals forming in these semicircular canals, that impedes the flow of endolymph, which mucks everything up, but just on one side. So you're getting two different bits of information going into the, those vestibular nuclei and affecting this reflex. So these are causes of vertigo. Um, I think. Uh, ENT surgeons like pouring like warm, ear, warm water and cold water into your ears and they can uh, generate a nystagmus on one side or the other. Anyway, you get the idea. We have talked about this before in the anatomy of the ear. I just wanted to join up in a little bit more detail the sensory apparatus with the afferent nerve the brainstem nuclei to point out that this is another brainstem reflex and then the, the motor outputs to the eyes. So we're, we're adding more neuroanatomy detail onto our knowledge of the anatomy of the, the ear and, and the eyes. Okay, you could talk for hours about this sort of thing, so it's really difficult to keep it concise, but uh, uh, Maybe we'll come back to this or anyway. Right, that's enough for me. Uh, see you next week.